Uh, my message to the, the CEOs, the CEOs is, you know, at $74 million, you know, collectively earning that, you know, how many yachts can they need, you know, you know to, to, yacht, to, to water uh, ski behind it? You know, I mean, it's just crazy. You know, I don't Meanwhile, every single day. <laughs> so. Well, it makes like sense that this would make sense to you because of the way you dress. I'm a, You're a traditionalist. I'm a traditionalist. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. I was always taught you dress for the job that you want, not yeah. for even the job that you have. And I, too, walked all of those halls. Mm -hmm. And I, I walked into the Supreme Court building. And, and I walked into federal courtrooms all the time. And you don't wear jeans and you don't wear hoodies and you don't wear what you would wear coming out of the gym. And it, it just seems to me that even though there is no law, it is just a practice. Yeah. And, and I think that it demeans the office and the actual decorum in the Senate to walk around like Kristen Sinema with a bright pink wig. She looks like some sort of a weird, strange unicorn. You've got Ted Cruz that is like kind of walked in with his, with, with his sweat oh outfit. You've got, uh, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene just lacking decorum all the time with, with masks <laughs> yeah. that say things. And so, well, I but think none of that has anything least, to do with your clothing. But it's the very, well, you she know? had a big mask that said Trump won. And oh, it's like the okay. very least that you can do is just dress appropriately. Yeah, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Guys, I cannot believe what I just watched, okay? I gotta tell you guys. I'm going to do a lot of laughing in this video. And I really shouldn't be laughing because it's not funny. But this guy, John Fetterman, it is an absolute embarrassment to have this man as a sit sitting senator in this country, guys. There's no doubt in my mind. Xi Jinping, Putin, Kim Jong-un. Okay, all the leaders, okay, of our adversaries are laughing. They're laughing at us. Okay, they're pointing at the American government and mocking us. Okay, like quite literally in Saudi Arabia, they, they mock Joe Biden and Kamala Harris like every what year, right? They do some type of SNL uh, style skit to mock this administration, right? Didn't see too much of that under Trump, okay? But it's interviews like this that really make me believe that Democrats should be ashamed of themselves. They should be embarrassed. To vote for somebody like John Fetterman to the Senate, where this guy is completely, completely incoherent. It's comical, okay? And for Chris Hayes to sit here on MSNBC with a straight face and not laugh his ass off or basically end this interview, it it blows my mind. It really does. I can't believe it. But we I'm telling you, you guys, you just have to hear this interview. Where Chris Haynes is asking John Fetterman a ton of questions, mainly about the Senate dress code and his response because Democrats decided to lower standards uh, for John Fetterman, who refuses to dress up and come to work. <laughs> right? The dude refuses to dress up and come to work, and Democrats are like, okay, well, we're, we're, we're not going to make anybody dress up except the, the people that work for us, right? The peasants, you got to dress up in business attire, and, uh, you know, <laughs> we can come to work and sweatshirts and shorts and, and sneakers, right? Again, this country should be embarrassed. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. And Senator John Fetterman, Democrat of Pennsylvania, joins me now. Senator, it's good to see you. I haven't gotten a chance to talk to you in a while. Yeah. Great to be here. Um, let me let me start with the most important matter facing our country at this dire moment, which is the matter of the Senate dress code. Uh, which has recently been <laughs> recently been changed. Of course, of, of course, yes, yeah, no, of, of course. Um, I've heard about. I've heard that some people are upset about that, and the, the the right have been like losing their mind. You know, they're just like, oh my god, you know, dogs and cats are living together, and you know, like you said, <laughs> aren't there more important things we should be talking about rather than if if I dress like a slob? <laughs> yo, yo, this man. This man said, oh my God, dogs and cats are living together. What is he talking about? <laughs> what? what is he talking about? Somebody tell me, bruh. What is this man talking about? Now, I went and looked it up, okay? I looked it up because I was like, this man has to be referencing something, okay? He ain't just talking about 
cats and dogs, right? Uh, apparently, this is a line from Ghostbusters. That means mass hysteria, right? I mean, I guess what he's saying, okay, that there's going to be, uh, I guess, fake outrage <laughs> that Republicans are fake outraging, okay, uh, over the dress code. But again, the reality of the dress code situation is that, again, you should have respect, okay, respect for the halls of Congress, okay, you shouldn't just show up to work in, you know, sweatshirt and, you know, shorts or whatever, and I get why he does it, right, it's a branding thing, right, he's doing it to try to present himself as, well, I'm just a, a working class, you know, guy or whatever, normal guy, I understand that. But, you know, do that when you're back in your hometown, right? And you're in your state in, you know, your office, but not in the halls of Congress, okay? I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So, I mean, yeah, it is something to be upset about. Yeah, we should be upset that uh, politicians are lowering the standards of dress in the halls of Congress, especially when you got all the peasants that work for them having to actually adhere to a dress code. Right. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's hypocritical. They're doing it to accommodate you, but you've had enough accommodations. Right. I don't think you need any more accommodations. OK. At some point, you got to stand on your own two feet and, you know, present yourself in a way that's respectable. And again, especially when you have, you know, these issues that you're currently dealing with, present yourself in a professional way and people will take you more seriously. Because right now, I can't take John Fetterman seriously, okay? I don't think John Fetterman is a serious politician, okay? There's no way. I can't listen to a guy who has, you know, these types of issues and also at the same time, he can't even speak. It's like, well, this dude is not, like, the only thing I should pay attention is what you vote for. I shouldn't pay attention to anything that you say, right? <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying, you, you, just, you just go vote along with the Democrats, whatever they want you to vote for. You're, you're clearly being handled, right? You're clearly uh, a puppet, right? Uh, yes. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene said that Senate no longer enforcing a dress code for senators is to appease Fetterman is disgraceful. Dress code is one of society's standards that set etiquette and respect for institutions. Stop lowering the bar. Uh, what, what do you say to that? Well, you know, her platform, you know, really, she runs on more and more dingling, you know, picks, you know, on uh, in the the, me the meetings uh, over in, in the Congress. So, I, again, uh, I, I'm not really sure why she cares how I dress, uh, but, you know, she really takes it a different way. <laughs> she, she runs on more dingling picks. And the funny, the funny part about this, right? It's because he's struggling to recall words. Like, when he first said it, it, it sounded like he, he said, well, she's running on ding -a -lings. Really, she runs on more and more ding -a -ling. Period. Right? Nothing else. Marjorie Taylor Gray is running on ding -a -lings. <laughs> Yo, I'm dying right now, bruh. I'm dying. But I guess, I guess what he's saying... <laughs> That's what he's saying is that Marjorie Taylor Greene is running or put his weight like he's referring to her showing the nudes of Hunter Biden in Congress. <laughs> I think that's what he's trying to say, but it's just like, bro, how can Chris Haynes sit here with a straight face and not think that this is not OK, bro? This man should not be a sitting senator talking like this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I mean, like, this is just, this is, this is embarrassing, right? Marjorie Taylor Greene running on dingling. Dingling picks, right? This is what he means. That's what he actually means. Um, let, let's talk about uh, some of the, the big stuff going on in that House caucus. You in the Senate, basically my understanding of how things have operated since that deal was a bipartisan deal was struck for certain top line spending numbers for all of the funding bills that have to be passed to make the budget, keep the government running. The Senate has basically been delivering those and passing them by big 91 seven bipartisan majorities. The house today looks like it's falling apart. You've already got 17 no votes in that house Republican caucus saying we're not passing anything. What, what do you think's happening here? 
Yeah, you know, like I, I truly, I was, I was very proud of my colleagues, you know, because they're really about governance. That's what it is. And on the other, the, the house, the, the whatever they call themselves, Team America, or whatever they call themselves, <laughs> I just like, hey, I just like bring your vote. You know, otherwise, you know, they need to go hump a different leg. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> yo, yo, again, Chris Hayes, bro, how do you sit through this interview and not lose it, dog? How? This man just said, <laughs> they need to, I, I think he said, vote or go hump another leg? <laughs> bro, what is going through this mind? This man's mind? Why is everything for this man so sexual? I don't understand. I really don't. This man said Team America. I think it means Freedom Caucus, right? I feel like this is an episode of deciphering John Fetterman, right? This is what it feels like. Um, the, you were in, uh, you drove your, I think it's a Ford uh, from Braddock, Pennsylvania, where you live, out to uh, Michigan for, yeah, a, I did. for a rally yeah. uh, with the striking United Auto Workers. Um, I want to I wanna play you what President Biden had to say. Uh, about the strike and then get your thoughts on the strike. This is what President Biden had to say. Mm -hmm. The companies have made some significant offers, but I believe they should go further to ensure record corporate profits mean record contracts for the UAW. Let me say that again. Record corporate profits, which they have, should be shared by record contracts for the UAW. And just as we're building an economy of the future, we need labor agreements for the future. What do you think about the president's message to strikers and what were you telling them they're out on the line? No, again, I, I do know that Joe Biden is, is really a strong, incredible pro-labor president. That, that's a fact. And I know he's going to be involved in the way he should be. And we're going to all work towards, you know, a better ending for the, the workers. I mean, you know, I was proud to drive there. Well, I mean, I literally drove in, in my Bronco. You know, the Bronco wanted to meet its makers and where it was born. And that's where, they, you know, I greeted the workers that literally built my car. And I'm proud to stand with them. And, you know, it's it's really cynical the way now that, that Trump is now visiting there. Uh, but, again, we've already been there, you know, been there, done that. And, uh, you know, it's they say, you know, uh, imitation and flattery. Yeah. So when it comes to this striking situation out in Michigan, this is actually a really important story. Because Trump, once again, is bucking the GOP establishment. Let's talk about the economy. And I want to start by talking about this big standoff between the auto workers and the big three auto manufacturers. Yeah. My question for you, Mr. President, whose side are you on in this? Uh, I'm on the side of uh, making our country great. Uh, the auto workers uh, are not going to have any jobs when you come right down to it. Because if you take a look at what they're doing with electric cars, Electric cars are going to be made in China. The auto workers are not going to have any. I'll tell you what, the auto workers are being sold down the river by their leadership, and their leadership should endorse Trump. The reason is you got to have choice. Like in school, I want school choice. I also want choice for cars. If somebody wants gasoline, if somebody wants all electric, they can do whatever they want. But they're destroying the consumer and they're destroying the auto workers the auto workers will not have any jobs Kristen, because the all of these cars are going to be made in china the electric cars automatically are going to be made in china so let's talk about ua i think tim scott came out and said uh if you strike you're fired <laughs> right i think ronald reagan gave us a ronald reagan gave us a great example when federal employees decided they were going to strike he said you strike you're fired simple concept to me to the extent that we could use that once again absolutely the second thing that i would do though is very important this is a probably not a well-known fact the first thing part of the challenge that we have today with president biden is and i don't mean this to be disingenuous i mean this to be sincere i'm not sure if the words are bought and paid for but it certainly he has been uh, leased by the by the unions and i say that because the first bill he passed Y'all remember the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package? That only had 1% for COVID vaccines? It had $86 billion, I believe, for union pensions. Because they keep making these deals. And as a result of the deal, they promise too much, deliver too little, and the taxpayers pick up the tab. 
which I mean, you know, hey, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm not sure how that's going to play well for him when it comes to trying to reach some of these workers, okay, in the general election. But Trump realizes, because he's smart enough to understand, okay, I can get these voters, right, these pro-union voters, by essentially just blaming it on China, right? And that's his. That's the play here. I'm going to show up and support. I'm going to side with them, which, again, is bucking the GOP establishment, right, uh, because he wants these blue-collar worker votes, right? And, I mean, I I'm just saying, like, Trump's political instincts here in terms of the general election, general election appeal, people are going to have to bear with it, right? He's going to do a lot of things and he's going to say a lot of things that people aren't necessarily going to like too much, but he's trying to win a general election. And this honestly is what he should be doing if he actually wants to win, okay? He has to appeal to people that are the working class and he has to essentially buck some GOP traditional orthodoxy in order to do that. And he did that in 2016. He's doing that now. And I, I, I mean, I'm just saying Trump is in full blown general election mode. That, that is actually an interesting set of politics. Trump decided to skip the debate and go be with the people. Yeah. Let's talk about that. That the ex president, uh, is going to give some speech to, in Detroit to, to, to auto workers, uh, which was announced recently instead of his appearance in the second debate. And obviously, I think you know this well. I mean, you won in a state with a lot of the kinds of voters that were maybe Obama, Trump, Fetterman voters, right? Those provided probably a margin for your victory. Um, the the ex-president trying to make a play for them. What is your message to those folks about who is going to look out for the interests of people like auto workers in the White House between possibly Donald Trump or Joe Biden? Well, of course, he's only going there to be cynical, and he's, he thinks he can appeal to, to the voters in Michigan. But he also doesn't have a lot of competition either. You know, DeSantis, you know, you know, you know he doesn't, you know, he, you know, I, I dress the way he campaigns, you know. So uh, he's able to just, you know, skip, you know, debates because the others, they just don't have competition. But, you know, I really don't believe there's no chance to the Trump, Trump to win in, in Michigan. He sure isn't going to win in Pennsylvania, but it's just a, it's a cheesy, cynical play. Well, again, the politics of that is that, well, Trump wants to win the Rust Belt. Okay. And that's where, you know, he lost the 2020 election is in those Rust Belt labor states that he won in 2016, because basically in 2016, running on protectionism, okay, um, that was basically a pro-worker policy, right? That's a pro-worker worker position. And Trump being a populist, that <laughs> that is the natural position to take. And again, that's, that's why he won. Again, and that's, you know... Again, that that's the part of politics I think people get uncomfortable with, but that is like that that is politics. So again, um, this interview right here is an absolute embarrassment. I don't know how anybody in their right mind lines up to vote for this guy, John Fetterman. Okay, I, I'm just saying it is an embarrassment that this man is actually a sitting senator. He can't really string together a coherent thought. Even though I will say at the end, he was kind of right about the differences between Trump and DeSantis and other people in the GOP when it comes to that labor issue. But yeah, I mean, outside of that, <laughs> again, I don't know why this guy's a sitting citizen, a, a, a sitting uh, sitter. It is an embarrassment to this country. Let me know what you guys think. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, share a black conservative perspective. Peace.